Hey, it's Craig Syracuse and welcome to another episode of Walk in Faith, the show where we go beyond the image and we discover who our guests really are. You might know them from TV, the big screen, or even the world of sports, but do we really know who they are as a person? Do we know what motivates them? Do we know what inspires them? Well, that's what we're here to find out. On today's episode, I had the opportunity to sit down with author Chris Lowney for the new book, On the Ignatian Way. Stay tuned. Walk with us. Thank you very much for uh, coming all the way to Brooklyn. Like we were saying before the interview, uh, and, and I'm not just saying this, I really enjoyed the book. I really did. Thanks for saying um, that. I know a lot of people say that, but then I truly mean it. And I was saying earlier that a lot of priests, a lot of friends were saying, you should research St. Ignatius. And when it came across my desk, I said, I need to find out who St. Ignatius is. And I've been researching and exploring and trying to figure out gifts. What is a gift? So I want to ask you some of those questions and you know, feel free if you don't want to answer one, that's fine. But the first thing is St. Ignatius. I mean, I don't know if a lot of people know about him, but he is like a Hollywood star, like his story. I mean, can you tell us about St. Ignatius? And if you had to pick one thing that you admire the most about him, what would that be? It's hard, that's a hard question. Yeah, so I'll, I'll give you the, the 42nd uh, story of, of St. Ignatius. And I think he's a real uh, relevant saint for the 21st century for the reason I'm gonna say. He grows up in uh, a part of Spain near Bilbao his family's like a minor nobility. He wants to be a soldier. That's his plan A for life. And then his leg gets shattered in his first big battle. And so, boom, plan A goes out the window. And he has to reinvent himself, so to speak. He wouldn't say that in the 16th century, but that's how we would say it in the 21st. So in that respect, I think he's a very modern saint. You know, this idea of a lot of us go through a moment where we say, oh, man, you know, I thought this was what my life should be about, but now I have to revisit and that is a very relevant Ignatian idea. So anyway, his leg gets shattered, he's convalescing for months, he has a profound conversion experience, and the first thing he ends up doing is uh, deciding he's gonna go on a pilgrimage, and 500 years later, we've created a trekking trail along the path that he actually walked. And now he created the Jesuits, right? He was, it was him and was it two other people? That's right, so uh, he gets through his pilgrimage, he goes through a decade of studies and other life transition, and he ends up with a small group of friends starting what we today call the Jesuits. The most famous of his colleagues would be Francis Xavier that most people would know of. And um, now the, uh, you know, the Jesuits have been with us not quite for 500 years, but you know, for centuries, you know, a lot of people would, would know Jesuits if they're basketball fans. You know, they'd know Georgetown, they'd know Gonzaga, they'd know these good basketball teams. But Jesuits have been well known for education, have been well known for working with extremely poor communities, uh, well known for retreat work and, and so on, including all around the metropolitan area, places like Fordham and, and so on. And what I found interesting too in the book you wrote about how, I forgot where it was, but he, he went somewhere and he wrote his sins for three days. He spent three days writing all his sins. And I, th I thought about that. I said, how many sins does this the St. Ignatius actually have? I mean, how long would it take for a guy like you and me to write our sins? Probably a couple of hours. Yeah, right. Yeah, and I think in a way, you know, he's, he's also a good saint to think about sin because, you know, it seems to me people can tend to spill off in one extreme or the other. For a lot of people, there's no such thing as sin. <laughs> you know, everything's fine, it's just who I am, what I want. So that's one kind of extreme. Another kind of extreme is this, you know, horrible, obsessive scrupulosity where, you know, people can't accept themselves ever, they're never good enough, they can't accept the fact that we're forgiven, that God forgives us, that, you know, confession really means absolution in the end. And that other problem is really Ignatius' problem. You know, he goes through a phase where he's horribly obsessed with his own sinfulness, and really it takes him almost a year to get over that and begin to become, a, you know, a happier, more productive person in the world. And how would you define a sin? For instance, like, because um, some people, like you said, they could justify a sin and say, well, it was like he was going to kill the Muslim, right? That sort of, right. that sent them something that offended yeah. him about Mary. Yeah. And that would have been justifiable, right? Yeah. So how do we define a sin? And, and why, why are we able to justify okay, our well, I'm not sure you should ask me. I, I asked a couple of priests <laughs> and they say, theologian. missed Mark. But here's, here's, <laughs> what, I, uh, here's what I un understood and remember. Uh, you know, a sin, first of all, you have to know, is knowing. 
it's not, you know, a mistake is one thing. Mm -hmm. You know, there's sometimes when I say the wrong thing, but I didn't mean to. A different thing is knowingly doing what's wrong or in more theological terms, what's against God's rule or law or whatever. So, we, you know, I mean, when I say something and I know I'm sticking in the knife, mm -hmm. that's different than when I just said something and it just happened to hurt you. Uh, you know, when I steal, we all, we all know the Ten Commandments. Some of, some of sin is pretty easy uh, to understand. Other aspects of sin are more complex and that's why we end up wanting good counselors and mentors and advisors in our life to kind of understand what's really going on inside me. And you mentioned earlier about how St. Ignatius had sort of this conversion where he felt the presence of God. Why do you think God sort of, sort of picked him? He had 12 siblings, right? I mean, do you think that God speaks to us every day and it's just difficult for sometimes for us to acknowledge that? Or would, was he specifically chosen for this mission in life? Here's my opinion, but I think it's not just my opinion, would be that everybody is chosen in one way or another. Now, people's callings are different, you know, um, but I think in one way or another, uh, there's some plan, some role, some mission for all of us. You know, maybe for me it's uh, being good to my kids and taking care of them. Maybe for another one uh, it's to be a really good teacher. Maybe for another one it's being an honest business person. But, you know, I feel part of our job is to kind of pay attention to what we might be called to. And, and for me, you know, it doesn't, in a way it's not helpful when we have this idea that, oh, you know, like, St. Paul was called this big dramatic thing, St. Ignatius exactly. was called this big dramatic thing, but you know, that's not relevant to me because I haven't heard any explosions or thunder or voices. And I think that's a misperception. You know, part of our role, I think, as Christians is to try to get our radar a little tuned in to what uh, God may be calling us to in the specific concrete circumstances of our life. You know, for Ignatius, it was a real dramatic thing. For most of us, not so dramatic. I 100% agree with you. I mean, it's, it's like, like you said, like a lot of us, we have this idea of how God's going to speak to us, like he's going to come and appear or the burning bush, when in actuality, he's around us all the time, and we have to be open to that. You know, in your book, you mentioned uh, about, you know, following or listening to that inner voice. And sometimes it's difficult to listen to that inner voice. So what I want to know is, how do we know we're following God's plan? Like, how do we know this is really part of what the mission of our life or the purpose of our life, or if it's our own desires that we're sort of, we're moved towards? Like, how do we distinguish God's voice from our own desires? Okay, so that, I mean, that's a, a good question. Sometimes that's an easy question. I mean, we have, um, in a way, some playbooks, some rule books, you know? If w what I feel like I would enjoy doing is being a thief, okay, I kind of know that that's not really in accordance with God's plan for anybody's life. I think a trickier thing for all of us is choosing among different things that are all good. Should I marry this person or not? Should I take this job or that job? Uh, how should I use my spare money? You know, should I donate to this charity or that charity? You know, those kinds of questions. And I mean, look, I, I don't think there are uh, magic answers to that. When, you know, eventually someday we can all ask God why he didn't make it clearer to figure all this stuff out. But one of the ideas that Ignatius talks about is, you know, whenever you have a big decision in life, spend a few quiet moments, prayerful, not just once, but maybe over the course of even days and weeks if you have that much time, and just pay attention to what's going on inside you. In other words, when you imagine going down one road, yeah, I should marry the person, is that, does that bring a lot of tranquility, peace, confirmation? or does it leave you with a lot of anxiety? And he has this idea that um, uh, if we approach it prayerfully, what's going on inside us can sometimes be an indicator of, of God's spirit at work within us. In other words, uh, to be at peace and so on is a good confirming signal. To have a lot of second thoughts and worries and doubts is a sense, oh man, maybe I have to keep praying and thinking. Welcome back. I love that answer. Um, and, and you talk about that too, about the fork in the road. And one thing I thought about, do you think someone could still be successful if they don't follow God's plan? And do you think if we ignore God's plan because of fear, because of anxiety, does that become a sin? Like, is God, are we going to have to answer to that when we meet God in heaven and say, you know, you didn't follow what I placed in your heart, you ignored the signs, is it a sin? 
All right. Well, I hope you ask theologians these questions. I also. do. <laughs> some of them don't. Some of them don't answer. They go, "Oh, God, so, ask look, the bishop." Here's what I would would say about that. Um, can people so can people be successful without following God's plan? In a worldly sense, one hundred percent yes. <laughs> I mean, I worked in investment banking. I know a lot of people who were very successful, and some of them didn't appear to be following God's plan. Sometimes either what what any human would consider moral. So in the worldly sense, absolutely. Now. I think maybe more the way you're asking is, uh, in a Christian sense, could we be successful without following God's plan? And I, I don't know, if I, if I might reframe that question a little bit, to me, the way I would understand it would be, um, what's my responsibility with respect to my own gifts? You know, whatever gifts I have. I can be a good nurturing parent, or I'm a good writer, or whatever my gifts are. Um, I guess I feel like I'm called to be a good, you know, that, that uh, parable of where the one steward gets one talent while the master is away, the other guy gets two and the other guy gets five, and then he comes back and he's angry at the yeah, one who doesn't invest it well. Mm -hmm. So th I guess I feel that, you know, I mean, I, I don't know that that's a matter of eternal damnation if I don't use my gifts well, but I guess I feel that's my obligation as a human being and a Christian to try to understand how can I use my gifts well in the world for good purposes? And also, too, when you when you are using your gifts, you know, and it's part of God's plan, you see how sort of the doors they open up a little bit easier. When you're using them for your own sort of selfish desires or for fame or for insecurities, sometimes it's a little squeaky. So, did you have that moment? You, you know, you mentioned about J.P. Morgan. Did you have a moment where it also uh, you, everything was clarified and you said, "Okay, this is really what I need to. This is the path." Or did you always have sort of this gift? No. Of, <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> you know. Um, I no aha moment, no thunderclap, no magic Burning voices. <laughs> I, I mean, I did. Uh, you know, I, I think what I always suggest to people—I do a lot of leadership conferences and so on—is that people who lead well in life are somehow self-reflective and thoughtful. I try to practice that in my own life. You know, be somebody who is thinking about what am I doing and where am I going and does this feel right? And so I, you know, I always had the idea that there would come a phase in life or a moment in life where I should think about moving on to the next chapter. And that's when I began writing first with Heroic Leadership, which did very well, and now in some number of books since. And how many books have you written in, in during Seven. your career? Seven. Yeah. And when did you start writing? When were you? Uh, about 2001. 2001. Yeah. This is, wow, that's amazing. That's great. And do you have another book uh, like you know, in the works, or are you? I don't have anything at the moment. I mean, there, we're talking about On the Ignatian Way. I have another book that came out right about now called Make Today Matter, which is a kind of a um, lessons learned, tips for how to make every day effective in one's life as a principled person. And that's also out right now, in fact. And what inspires you? Like, what inspired you to write this book? You know, I always had a, uh, w once in my life, I did the, um, the, the pilgrimage to Santiago, which a lot of okay. people would know about. That's the more famous one. And early in my life, I had gone to a Jesuit high school. I was a Jesuit seminarian for okay. a few years. And I always kind of thought, you know, there should be, like the Santiago pilgrimage, there should be an Ignatian pilgrimage. A real person made this trek 500 years ago. It's a very interesting part of Spain. It's very beautiful. It was an important moment in this guy's life. And so I always had in the back of my mind, it would be interesting and fun to try to create a, a real pilgrim trail. And fortunately, the Jesuits in Spain also got interested, and they assigned somebody to work on it. And together, we sort of put together um, you know, the trail that now exists, about 400 miles through Spain. Wow. What year did you uh, put this together? What was the first uh, the, It uh, debuted um, probably about five years ago. Five years ago. Yeah. And it's been growing steadily ever since. Uh, now, there may be, I'd say, about 1,000 people who do some or all of it in the course of the year. You know, if somebody went from end to end, it would take a month. Yeah. And a lot of people might go, like, for a week or a few days. It would be from the Basque uh, part of Spain, which is one corner of Spain by Bilbao, and then the ending parts are Montserrat and Manresa, which are famous in Jesuit iconic history. Uh, Montserrat is a beautiful Benedictine monastery up in the mountains. It's still there. Manresa, where the spiritual exercises mostly were written, and those two towns are very close to Barcelona. So people are going from up in the Basque country all the way down to by the Mediterranean. Now, why would someone want to go on a pilgrimage? Like, what would motivate them to do it? I mean, and, you know, I've met some that do it for sport and other reasons, yeah. but why would someone want to do a pilgrimage? You know, um, I'll tell you my take and my conclusion, that modern life is, like, utterly chaotic. You know, my whole day is tweet, music in my ear, social media, email, phone call, this, this, this. 
And, you know, we're like 100% tuned in to every crazy distraction that crosses our radar. Mm -hmm. There's a lot. The only thing we're not tuned into is what ultimately is most important. You know, what, what's going on deep inside me, what's important in life. And let me tell you something. You go on a pilgrimage where, like for six hours a day, the only thing you're doing is walking at three miles an hour, you're going to tune in to what's going on inside you, you know, because eventually, whether because you're moved or because whether you're so bored of just trudging along there, you start to ruminate over your life. And I've always had the experience of anybody who's done something like this, that they end up, you know, all this stuff that maybe has been deep inside them, old memories, old experiences, kind of percolates up and they process it. And that always seems to happen to people. I like that. We'll be right back. A few more questions. We're right back with Walking Faith. Welcome back. Thank you so much for this opportunity, like I said earlier. Um, so throughout your book, there was a few pilgrims, and I know you said you know, various people do it for different reasons. A lot of in their diaries, they were short, but there was a lot of things were echoed. Uh, and, and some of the things even I search for, and I think a lot of us search for, is, is sort of making Jesus the center of our lives and, and living in the moment. And the other thing that I really liked was when we meet somebody, the first thing we do is sort of project our fears or project our emotions and not really listen to the other person. And like you said, during that period, you have to. And can you tell me about maybe your experience or some of the pilgrims that you chose in the book and, and why? Let me mention a couple of pilgrims who've, who've, uh, you know, wrote, who wrote up little stories in, in On the Ignatian Way. There's one guy who I happen to know personally, very fit, who led a group, and then he finds halfway through the trek, he starts suffering terrible shin splints. And so for him, this is pretty humiliating that he thinks of himself as a leader and he ends up having to wait out a couple of days. Then he's back on the road the next day, and he says that morning, his prayer was, uh, Jesus, I need you to be with me as my companion today. His great insight is that he comes to realize, of course, Jesus is with me every day. We become acutely aware of it sometimes when we have a problem or something, as he did, but he has that insight, you know, of appreciating, no, it's not just this day when I, when I need something, you know, Jesus is always there. I'll mention one other very different kind of experience. One woman uh, kind of trudges along and probably like all of us, she's used to going through life at 60 miles an hour and now she's going at two miles an hour and she has this very uh, deep sense of the beauty of the world around her. You know, she's able really to look now and appreciate all the beauty she sees and she gets overcome with a great feeling of gratitude, you know, for creation and for all the gifts that she has and so on. And so that's her, her grace, her gift that she gets out of the pilgrimage. And, you know, as you say, you, you find certain kinds of themes come back but you also find that each person has their own experience and they get different things out of it depending on where they are in life. I agree. We, we did a couple of pilgrimages, World Youth Day, and I think a lot of people had different experiences. And, and one thing I learned was in the beginning, especially with the, the young kids, you know, they go there, they think it's a vacation, which I actually like the fact that they, that's what they think, right? And during the period, they sort of have, like I like to call the test of faith. Mm -hmm. You know, they're up at that high and then something happens, whether it's they miss home, they're uncomfortable, or Jesus is speaking to them. Something happens during that time that has an effect on them. Yeah. But now the only thing is they go back home. And now it's the clutter, it's the, the voicemails, it's the phone. How do they stay, how do they keep Jesus centered? Is it just you go on a pilgrimage, you go home and that's it? Or does yeah. it constantly you need to work at yeah. it? You know, first the, um, uh, you know, you mentioned the folks who, who go on World Youth Day and something happens to them. And I think that is uh, very true. People are going on an outer journey whether the trip to Rio or walking the Camino to uh, Montserrat Manresa, but they end up talking about the inner journey. Like, in other words, they don't end up saying, oh yeah, I went and I saw this, I saw that. They spend more time talking about this is what happened to me. And you, you know, you point out that, of course, the big trick is how can I make it so that this has a lasting impact in my life? I mean, that's a hard, a hard question to answer. I happen to think that when people have a little time and space, that makes it more likely that it'll have a lasting impact after, you know, because they've gotten into, they've discovered a different rhythm for life and they kind of say, okay, I need to hang on to something like this. On the other hand, sometimes people take these frenzied uh, pilgrimage trips like to Rome or somewhere, okay, man, a plane here, bus trip there, da, 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 and it's kind of like regular life, you know, so they don't really get out of 
the normal life rhythm, and therefore I think sometimes it's a little harder for them to take away something laugh lasting because they haven't broken out of the daily crazy habits that we all carry around. I agree. I think, it, yeah, when, like I said, World Youth Day, you know, we had some really bad weather and we had times where you, you saw sort of these kids where they, they sort of, not hit rock bottom, but they, they hit sort of the yeah. end. And yeah. then the next day, they were changed, yeah. for that moment at least. Yeah. But then they go back home and sometimes yeah. it's difficult. Now, what types of people would go on this pilgrimage? I know you mentioned you do groups and stuff like that, but is this like if someone's skeptical or doesn't know if it's right for them, like what types of people? Is it someone like me? Best or is person it to go. <laughs> Someone who's skeptical. Okay. I mean, the, so the answer to the question is all kinds of people go. You know, uh, one of the things that's interesting is the demographics tend to skew old and young. Uh, like, in other words, you find a lot of uh, retired or near retired people, you know, folks that you might say, oh, can they really do it? And absolutely. You know, so a lot of people, even 60s, even 70s, boom, 400 miles, they do it. And then at the other end of the spectrum, you see a lot of, you know, young adults, even uh, teenagers in high school. And um, I think in a way, for those kind of groups, people who are teaching in schools or in ca campus ministry, I think it's a good thing for them to think about, you know, maybe taking a group for a week in that age group for this reason that, um, you know, traditional organized religion for people who are 16 years old, 18 years old, 20 years old, sometimes that is really a hard sell. They don't want any part of it, you know? I mean, this is reality in the 21st century, but something like this, sometimes can be a way in the door mm -hmm. for people in that difficult young adult age bracket. You know, it, um, it, it's just different enough that it, that it draws them in and maybe invites them then into a deeper religious experience in a way that they're ready to accept, able to accept. Um, when sometimes young people, you know, walking into the church here and going to Mass is unfortunately not something that speaks to them as immediately. Oh, you're right, especially, and not to say you should, but if you market this in a different way to attract a different yeah. demographic, like to them, it might go for, because it's sporty or if it's a yeah. form of exercise, but during that, that period, they have, a, they have this sort of experience yeah. with, uh, with Jesus. Yeah. That's, yeah, and you know, look, I mean, I'm, I don't, I mean, we're not here to talk about evangelizing, but I happen to feel, you know, we have a, a the church, we have a big challenge in the 21st century, you know, especially among young people. People, they, this is just not where their heads are, they're just not interested. And it seems to me our job is not to sit around and blame young people. Mm -hmm. Our job is to figure out what kinds of experiences can we create, what kinds of ways can we engage them that might draw them in a little bit, you know, and to me, experiences like this um, do often draw young people in. I agree. So, you know, we get very young people going, sometimes on organized trips by a school or a parish group or something. We get sometimes retired people going. A lot of people go alone. There's guidebooks out there, tell you everywhere to stay, everywhere to go, all the coaching you need. Nice. There are arrows all the way along the route. So there are a lot of people who just say, I'll, I'll take this on on my own. And then there are other people who want to go in the comfort of a guided group because they may not feel adventurous to want to try and do it all on their own. Yeah, I, I, when I thought about too, uh, I forgot what Pilgrimer was, where he says he would travel and just walk until you, you know, you can't walk anymore and then you would find a place to stay. Right. And that's not me, like that's completely out of my comfort zone. I would say, where are we staying? What are we eating? Yeah. What time? I would need a compass. Like I, that, that's, and that's what I would probably need is to be completely taken out of my comfort yeah. zone. Yeah, and who knows, you know, I mean, when you go, maybe after two or three days you'd become kind of different and say, okay, well, now I maybe wing it a little bit more, you know? Yeah. yeah. I People would have different experiences. I would definitely be leaving some of my goods on the way because right. I would overpack and... Right. But so now when is your next, next pilgrimage and how can people, if they, they're interested in, in you know, being right. part of this group? Okay, so I think the easy, if, if folks have any interest, uh, I think the easiest thing to do is, uh, I'm very easy to contact. I, uh, there's a website which is based on my name, Chris Lowney, C-H-R-I-S, L-O-W-N-E-Y, one word, dot com. People could send me a note. I'm very happy to give any kind of coaching, advice on how they could go about it. Uh, there's a priest in uh, Spain, a Jesuit, who always got leads at least a couple of uh, pilgrimages each year. Uh, I, I tend not to do open pilgrimages myself, but I do a leadership uh, class with MBAs along the Camino. So there are different ways people can access it. And if they, um, you know, want to track me down, 
via the website. I'm more than happy to help people figure out what might be a good way for them to approach this experience. And of course, the kind of safe, easy way in the door is they could just read this book and I think they see how it feels book. and mm -hmm. say, oh yeah, you know, there's something that I might be interested in. I agree. I think everyone should read the book. I really enjoyed it. And last question, is there a certain month or a certain time where people should... Uh... If people are going to go, the, uh, the, the nicest weather times a year are like April, May, and September, October. Often for school groups, that doesn't work. You know, mm -hmm. so folks are doing it in the summer and it's hot. But you know, they, that, that's part of the experience too. Um, but let me also stress that you know, a lot of people who are, who are watching us are not physically gonna do it. You know, they don't have the time or interest or they're raising four kids, I might do it in 15 years. And um, you know, we, all, we also, in the things we've written, uh, we want to try to also invite armchair pilgrims, so to speak. You know, in other words, you mentioned the uh, narratives that a couple of people have written mm -hmm. of their own experience, and people can just read through those narratives. The end of this book is a version of these spiritual exercises of Which Ignatius, like so they could read other people's experience and you know, then even pray their own way through it. Uh, right in their home in Brooklyn or Jackson Heights, Queens, where I grew up, or wherever the heck they, they happen to be. <laughs> well, I, I definitely agree with you. I felt like I was on the pilgrimage for uh, you know the 200 pages. But thank you so much, and like I said, I really hope people do read this book, especially our audience, because it, it will have a lasting effect on my life. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks a lot. Thank you. God bless. Okay. So today we had the opportunity to sit down with Chris Lowney, and after each episode, I like to sit and reflect and think about what the takeaway was for me and also hopefully for the viewers. And a few things just stands out within the book is one is, the number one thing is to make Jesus the center of our lives. I'm not saying that you know I'm perfect or I'm able to do that yet, but something that I'm working towards. And the other thing too is to sort of live in the moment. You know, one thing that they, they stress was sort of, you know, there's a lot of hustle and bustle and there's a lot of distractions, you know, especially living in, in the city. And during this time, this pilgrimage, we have the opportunity to sort of, to listen to what God is calling us to do, to listen to what God is saying to us within our heart, and to just live in the moment. And when we meet strangers, which I really liked, is we don't always have to project our fears and our emotions. Let's take the moment to actually listen to them and listen to what's going on in their lives. Hope you enjoyed today's episode, and until next time, thank you for walking with us.